Woohoo! Exactly. This is the last night of the 2018 GitCon. Yeah, so sad. On behalf of Warwick, I want to thank all of you for showing up and make this event uh, such, uh, such a ev um, successful event for the companies, I hope for the YouTubers too, and I hope all of you are happy with the outcome from the GitCon this year. Are you? Yes. Very good. That's what I thought. Very good, so I'd say see you next year for the GitCon number three in September, October 2019. Ja, weiß ich. <laughs> Shane and Rick will, ple will play Bibi Blocksberg later. Just for her. <laughs> Rick, you're on it, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so hope to see you again next year. Thanks for showing up. Have a safe trip home. And uh, for tonight's talk, we have the mighty Rick Beato on stage as a host. And after that, Shane and Rick from In The Blues will, of course, play the blues. Yes. So enjoy the evening. Have a safe trip. Thanks, everybody. See you. Hey, everybody. I'm Rick Beato. I'm going to invite up. Mr. Adam Neely with me. Hello, my name is Adam Neely. I'd like to invite Rick Beato to start talking right now. So this discussion <laughs> between Adam and I here, and all of you, is called Analog Feel in a Digital World. So I was thinking about this. A lot of people my age, I'm 56, complain about people not playing instruments and programming things and fixing things and DAWs. But I kind of have a different view on this. Uh, back in the 80s, 1984 or so, MIDI was invented. Maybe it was 83. And people started programming drum machines. People started playing keyboard bass on things that was all that were all quantized to the to the grid, even though there wasn't really a grid because there were no DAWs. But that began this journey to where we are now. Around 1999, DAWs started to become used regularly in recording studios, even though then you had to have a Pro Tools operator that you would need to pay extra money to, and they'd have a Pro Tools certification. And you'd have to rent the Pro Tools gear from the studio. It's usually 500 bucks a day, something ridiculous like that. Then they came out with this thing called the Digi 001. Avid did. They were one of the first companies to come out with a home DAW that people could use and actually record albums with. Now, at that time, in the year 2000, I was 38 years old. I'd never engineered anything in my life, although I'd produced some records, but I always relied on other people to get sounds for me. And I realized the possibilities of using digital audio workstations, the editing possibilities. You could go in, you had a grid line, you could move things around. People still didn't really do beat detective yet. That's a way of quantizing things, rhythms. It doesn't have to be drums. But the possibilities were immense for what you could do. Now here's an old guy thinking like, hmm, that's gonna put studio players out of business eventually. Or being a great player isn't necessarily gonna be mean that much because you can fix anyone's part because Auto-Tune came out around the same time, that plug-in, and I would use it to fix people's vocals that didn't have the budget to sit there and do a million takes. They only had X amount of money to pay. I'm a producer, I want it to sound good. So I had to fix their parts. And eventually, you know, I mean, Cher already had that big hit song, Do You Believe, which was... Uh, in Life After Love. In <laughs> it's a great song. Great song. So 
that was already, we were already hearing that. Long before T-Pain, we were hearing that effect being used. We didn't know how common it was going to be, but my perspective on it, a lot, a lot of people my age, they'll say, well, you know, you're never going to get the feel of Phil Rudd on, on Back in Black. You're never going to get the, you're never going to get that John Bonham sound if you quantize the drums. You're never going to do this. You can't, you know, there's, you're not going to have the feel of the Rolling Stones. It's got to be sloppy. It's got to be a little bit out of tune, you know, and they're right to a certain degree. But I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for things like digital audio workstations that enabled people to fix things because I would not be able to apprentice as a beginning music engineer or music producer at 38 years of age if it wasn't for the fact that these things were invented to help people do things at home. Move that to the future. After 16 years of working, producing bands from that time when I got my Digi 01, I bought Final Cut Pro and I made my first video with it. I'd never really owned a camera before, but because of things like the iPhone, cameras became, they went everywhere with you. You're able to take this, these images, you put them in, you look at the WAV files, where the audio is, and it looks just like Pro Tools or like Logic. You make a cut, you move it around, you place things on the beat, just like you would do if you're editing audio because you are editing audio. So once again, I was able to change what I did at 54 years of age or 55 when I started doing this full time doing YouTube because of these advances in technology. And, but I still feel that it's important to have things that feel real. Adam? Yes, I agree. Um, so we were just talking about this. There's this clip uh, on YouTube of the great bass player, Anthony Jackson, who is an incredible bass player. He, has, he plays this like 36 inch scale, he calls it a subcontra bass, six string bass guitar. And it's just the most monstrous instrument ever. He plays beautifully, he plays, uh, there's some clips with him playing with Hiromi Uihara and Steve Gadden. Anyway, love the guys playing. And there's this clip from 1992 where he is complaining about it's literally called The Rise of the Machines. And in The Rise of the Machines, he's on a talk show talking about how he is going to lose all of his work to people who uh, program bass lines. And this is great, like, existential threat, not just to his career, but to music itself. And so, you know, it's, it reflects this anxiety, of course, about a lot of the studio musicians at the time and the 90s of being replaced by people who could program drum machines and program or, or repair or program or repair to the point where they their skills were not necessary anymore and so i found this rather amusing for a couple of reasons um i played this to a class of these like 17 18 year old jazz musicians um, and it was on this like lecture I was talking about artificial intelligence and composing, which is basically this thing that you know a lot of uh, source audio, or source <laughs> source audio is the company, uh, stock audio libraries uh, start using uh, you know artificial intelligence to like generate you know like ambient soundscape type things. And so we were talking about like what ha would happen if like artificial intelligence was going to eventually compose music. Maybe, are we going to be out of a career as musicians if artificial intelligence ever develops that ability? Maybe, I don't know, it's just something to think about. And so I played them this clip and they all, of Anthony Jackson talking about this being the end of music and they all laughed. Every single one of these 17 and 18 year olds thought it was the funniest thing ever, the cringiest thing ever. Because to them, the younger generation finds this era of music and era of music making so inspiring and so uh, like fruitful to them because they see technology being this very creative thing, not this thing that corrects musical performance, this thing that aids in musical discovery. The use of uh, you know MPCs and beat machines, the development of 
electronic music techniques, using like mixing in Ableton Live, doing all kinds of like augmented performances with electronic music and electronic instruments and real instruments. It's a very like exciting sort of time for young musicians in that regard. And it's a very scary time for people who aren't looking at the new technology as a means for developing new kinds of music. It's, they're looking at the new technology as a means of making them obsolete. And that's the thing that I, I typically am thinking about here. Like, I look at the new technology, I look at the ability to, maybe not necessarily correct, but the ability to, I mean, the ability to adapt. Um, Misha Mansour, guitarist for the band Periphery, says that, I, I was talking to him once, and he said, um, he looks at recording, recording music as composition versus as a record of one's performance. And that's something that I thought was kind of interesting, the idea that recording is, a, is just a different medium whatsoever from actually performing. And I think that's, that's kind of like the direction it's been, and that's kind of what it is. It's, it's another art form. It's not performing music. It's a means of composing. I guess that's, that's my perspective. But yeah. When I first started producing, I started right at the tail end of recording everything on tape. And what we would do is do pre-production, where you would rehearse with the band for a week or so, rehearse all the songs you're going to record because you don't want to be wasting time you want to get it as close as possible they'd have to play with click tracks and there wasn't that you weren't able to fix things unless you actually edited the tape and nobody had the budgets to do that but essentially when you edit tape you do the same thing you would do in pro tools or logic where you cut out space or add space between beats if you're fixing drums and um <sighs> The idea of composing, about recording, and about that being the composition, that is something that I went to after. I stopped doing pre-production, and I would just say, okay, we, let's just start recording. And we would rehearse, and we would record things, then we'd chop it up, move sections around, and we use the tape machine, or the Pro Tools, I, is what I use, as a way to change the arrangements to get them the way that we're going to record. And then many times we would record them in stages, for example, which isn't that different from when you know, people don't realize that, that on tape, it would be very common to record a verse with the whole band playing and cut pieces together. You take a chorus from one version, you know, the Beatles did it. They did it. They put two different versions of Strawberry Fields that were in totally different keys together, and they have a huge splice in it. This went on with four tracks. It's been going on since the beginning of recorded music. People like to think that it's DAWs that were doing these things, you know, but that's actually not really true. This has always been part of, of music. People did punch-ins forever, even in classical music. I remember somebody telling me they uh, worked with Wynton Marcellus back in, he did a classical album in, in the early 80s, and it was all on tape and they did 350 punch-ins on it. There's a Charles Mingus album that's probably one of my favorite albums of all time, The Black Saint and the Sinner Lady. And there is, yes, it is a fantastic album. And there are so many, so many cuts on that album. And it would not be the album it would be without all of the ridiculous splices and overdubs and all sorts of things. And I think it comes down to people looking at the recorded, at recorded music as being somehow a record of virtuosity or a record of authenticity or a record of something pure. And I think that that sort of like is, you know, it's artificial. It's the same way that like when we're vlogging or like taking social media pictures and, you know, we're, we're curating how we're coming out across to the world. And we're trying to make a statement with that. And it can be used for good or it can be used for bad, but like for recorded music, especially there's this like, um, I don't know how to even really, really describe it, fetishization of the authenticity of recorded music, and it's never really been the case. Uh, yes, ideally, if you just put a stick a microphone in a room and hit record and just play great music, it will sound fantastic, but at the same time, that's not really taking advantage of all the benefits of recorded music, at least from my perspective. You can do a lot more, so why not do it? Um, and I think there's just this idea that, like, Recorded music should be pure and the authentic expression of something, but that's really 
that's really not what it is. I don't think so, anyway. But. I would have bands that would come in and say, we want to get our, we want to mount it to sound live. We want to get our live sound. I said, so you want it to sound bad? <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> you should always would be bands that were terrible live would always want to sound live. And I said, well, live is live and making a record is making a record. And we're going to make a record. And making a record means that we're going to have things on there that you can't play live. The Beatles didn't play Sgt. Pepper's live, you know? The Beach Boys, I mean, they, nobody really plays their things live. They play live versions of the songs live. They don't do exact versions. If you're gonna, if you're gonna record live, just go to a bar and put up a couple mics or take it off the board, but don't go into a recording studio. Recording studios where you can actually be creative. Now, the idea too of studio musicians being out of business because of technology, in Nashville, there are a lot of studio players that don't work anymore. Guys that got triple scale 15 years ago don't work a lot because the track guy producers are what's big now. The Max Martinization, I just made up that term. It's a good term. Of music <laughs> is what's happened to country music where people, it's become pop music where the producer creates the beats, if you want to call it that, and, uh, and then they... They don't need any studio players because the guy that produces usually plays everything and they come up with all the parts and they do that. Now that's been going on in pop music forever. And, but people still hire session guys to come in. The only difference is that they hire them and then they beat detect their parts because many times they're going to be, they're going to want to, uh, you know, maybe go to a, a, to some type of a drum loop or something or there's that feeling that a lot of producers have that if it's not perfectly in time anymore, it sounds weird to people. And that is one of the things that has changed in music. That's why singers that I worked with up until two years ago like to hear auto-tune on their voice because they, any imperfection that you used to just live with or not even pay attention to, um, they don't accept anymore because they don't hear any things that are out of tune on the radio anymore. Well, I, I've actually had some conversations with singers about that, and they say that uh, because recording technology and microphones are so crisp and so clear, the amount of saturation on the vocal tracks, uh, you know, 30 years ago allowed for the imperfections, and now the the aesthetic is not to allow for the imperfections just because the recording technology picks up everything. What what are your thoughts on that um, idea? I don't I don't I don't I don't agree with that because things right. actually sound when I when I I have multi tracks of records that were recorded today and records that were recorded fifty years ago and invariably things that were recorded when I hear Chris Cornell for example singing on tape from from uh, Super Unknown the isolated vocal tracks they sound phenomenal when I hear isolated vocal tracks of Someone like Adele, for example, if you look, there was a great article that with uh, the guy that mixed the record, um, the, the uh, Mix 21, um, uh, Tom, uh, Tom, I'll think of it. He had some, a screenshot of his EQ that he had on the vocal. And in the EQ, he was taking out 18 dB at 930 hertz. He was taking out 24 dB at 1.6 K, and he was taking out something like 18 dB at 3.1 K. Now, these are really narrow, like notch filters for those of you that know anything about engineering. But the fact that there that you're able to do that, and these are incredibly offensive frequencies to the ear, which is why he went in there and did that. But you don't hear those things on. When I listen to old recordings, things off tape, I don't, you know, things that have been digitized, when I listen to them in Pro Tools, I don't hear any of those artifacts that I would hear from people that I record. I mean, there's, there's a singer with a band, big band I worked with, and I called him The Knife. I called him The Knife because he had 3.8K oh, that would just go like an ice pick in your ear, It'd drive you nuts, and you'd have to go in, and every E vowel, you'd have to go in and spot EQ it and take out that frequency because it, it would be so offensive to the ear. But that, and that kind of, I feel like, 
speaks to the idea that that's that's recording as an art form like you have to go in and edit how do you do you have to like as a singer do you have to cut that db or cut that frequency in order to perform live or like uh, no uh, they yeah. kill you, kill you live yeah <laughs> i mean uh yeah I, I think that like one of the things that i think is kind of cool that i've seen recently and it, it really only affects certain styles of music but definitely in electronic music and hip-hop the idea of the unquantized drum groove that's very very popular the j dilla beat which is kind of the anti-quantized beat which people have really been leaning into um recently just in the past five to ten years is like kind of a a, a means of i don't know maybe a, I see it as a rebellion against the hyper quantized, everything has to be exactly on the grid. Like if the snare is slightly behind or slightly ahead, that's just part of how it feels. Um, and there, I do see some young musicians and some people really leaning into that now as a means of kind of saying now that I don't, I don't like the, you're saying the gridification of music, but it's, uh, you know, it's just, it will, depends on the genre of music, I guess, yeah. So instead of taking questions here, which is uh, not even on, uh, I thought maybe we'd take some questions from the audience. Or at least I can't get the password on that. So uh, back in the talk about the analog days, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is representing a pure sine wave. Now we come into the digital DAW era back in the day, you know, the A to Ds and DDAs weren't quite up to par. Now we're getting there, 192, 24, it's getting pretty good, but everyone's listening to the medium on an MP3 file format off of your cell phone. Where do you think the industry needs to change to get the technology that's here to represent the sine wave up to par with the consumer standards? I don't know any big engineer or producer that records at 192. I know very few that record it. 96k most of the old school guys that still work work at 44 one almost invariably these are people in their 40s and 50s but they're generally people that mix all the big records that you hear uh they like to get things at 44k they don't you know um so the fact that people listen to them on iphones and on laptops i'm one of those people I have friends that make fun of me. They're, I can't believe you listen to that on there. I'm like, well, I listen to it on there, so believe it. Yeah, I've got 10 pairs of studio monitors at, at my place, but that's not always convenient to listen to. So you need to be able to mix things that they, so that they sound good on nice stereo, you know, mice monitors and so that they sound good on laptops. So um, I don't know. I, I've... The, uh, the file size, you know, recording at 192, 24 bit is not like recording in 4K. It's nothing like that. Uh, they are massively big files. People don't want to deal with that. If it's eventually going to go down to f to 44 one, or or you know, if they're going to be MP MP3s or MP4s that are at 256 or you know, you know, you're not going to get flack files that to listen to. You're going to buy them. You're going to listen to them off of Apple Music. You're going to listen to them off Spotify, and they're going to be bit rates going to be 320 or 256. And I'm one of these people that says you can't tell the difference. I did a video called Audio File or Audio Fooled, and I said you can't tell the difference. I don't care who you are. I don't care how high you can hear. They had this NPR test that they had over a hundred million people take and they played 128 320 and lossless wave file or flag files or maybe they played wave files and you know what people's average score was on the six things that they listened to it, it was basically 50 percent which means that they were guessing so adam yeah i mean i listened to just done like cheap headphones, I don't, yeah, I do everything there. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't know, like I, that's something I don't really care about. <laughs> I mix in 44, 1, 24 bit, that's, yeah, that's what I do. 
Okay, hold on. We have some questions here, but but I'm not saying that that's bad, though. I'm not, you know. Right, and how many people are listening to it on a really nice system? Almost nobody. I mean, it's kind of it's different than 4K because now 4K is being pushed as a consumer standard. Nice audio systems are not being pushed as a consumer no, standard. No, I mean, they're, yeah. they're actually, they've gotten worse. Yeah. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. And that's the world we live in. It's all about, once again, it's about convenience. People don't want to, uh, you know, people just don't have nice stereo systems. I have nice things to listen on. But they're not convenient to have, uh, you know, to, to hook up my phone to. Like, what do I listen? Would I go through Bluetooth or something? I don't even know. There's no, there's no cables to attach things. It's, uh, you know. Uh, you could just get beats by Dre. I could get beats. <laughs> yeah, you could just do that, and it solves all of our problems. Okay, so we have, we have a couple questions here. Who needs the pub when I can watch this? Awesome. Right, okay, is that a question? That's not a question. Need, no, that's not a question. Okay, so... Um, all that funky Seinfeld beat bass guitar is done on a keyboard. Did you know the Seinfeld, though, that they never played the same thing? Yeah, uh, the, the guy who does it changes the theme every episode based upon the cadence of Jerry Seinfeld's joke delivery and his opening monologue. That's actually not, that's, that's actually true. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not kidding. It's actually pretty amazing if you go and listen to it. It's one of the best parts of Seinfeld if you go and watch like old episodes of Seinfeld is hearing how the bass line changes with the vocal cadence of Jerry Seinfeld. Do, that, do people know that? Do anyone know Seinfeld, or are you too, too young for that? Do people still remember <laughs> Seinfeld? I don't even know. But no. did anyone notice that the bass is, is always different in the theme? OK. I, I, I just thought it was, you know, that people noticed that. But um, uh, what is this topic? That's a question. I, I don't, <laughs> Rick, you are the one that invited, you said that's jump on set. That's here, one thank of the you, questions Thank you, here. Jamie, here. <laughs> I, I've got a question. Adam, I'd like to piggyback off of what uh, that Anthony Jackson story you were telling. Okay. All right, so what about, <laughs> no, no, it's not, it's not a joke. This is I a know, serious I question. Know, no, 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 it's all right. Hey, don't judge me. All right, so, um, so like imagine, like let's go back like 100 years, and we have like only acoustic instruments. Everyone's playing classical music. And then all of a sudden, the electric guitar goes, comes out. And they're like, oh, no, here we go. All these guys are going to put us out of a job. But we still have classical music. It's just it's in Just the nobody thing, listens right? to it. They, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. at the university level, pretty much. Or in Europe, I'll bet it's thriving here, maybe. In Germany, know. people yeah, listen to Germany, classical yeah, music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, same thing. Computers start coming out, and all the session guys, and everyone's like, oh, no, here it comes. It's gonna, we're all about to lose our jobs. And it's like, well. I don't know. Do you see like maybe the same thing happening? Like you know, music just keeps evolving, and you know, maybe there's not anything to worry about. It's just we're gonna take that back seat, and the next technology is gonna do its thing, and then on and on it goes. Or I don't know. What do you think? Well, after computers write music for us, I don't know where is it. Where else is there to go? You know? Yeah. There, there's this website you can go to. Um, I forget where I found it. Where it's a, an AI consistently improvising music in the style of Chopin. Poorly, but there are moments, like five to 10 seconds of improv, like constantly improvising, 24 hours a day. But there are moments, like five to second, 10 second moments, where it's like, dang, that sounds pretty amazing. Five to 10 years from now, who knows? Um, but yeah. Well, and there's also, I mean, off of that, there's a, there's a, a website that you can subscribe to that'll, there's a computer that auto-generates music for you to sight read. Now, they're very basic melodies, and it kind of, you know, it works. It's just something for you to read at sight. But where it gets interesting is there's a mode in there where you can have four of them at once. You know what I mean? So you can do, like, a quartet, basically, is what it's intended for. But when you, read, when you press play and you listen to it, and you're like, oh, wow, there's real counterpoint happening in yeah. there, and, like, there's voice leading. And, again, the, the melodies don't make sense, but you're like, I don't know, I don't know. The, the, like, the, the technology's there, and it's developing. And I don't know, it's, I think it's scary. I think it's Skynet. Well, to try and predict things, 
whether technology is going to be able to achieve this. I don't ever try and predict that because if you predict it, you're probably going to be wrong. Somebody said here, what do you prefer to listen on good, good music on an analog setup or a cell phone? Well, I prefer to listen to it on, an, on an analog system with a power amp through my powered monitors. I prefer listening to music like this two minutes before the gig, trying to learn the song. That's my, my mode. But if I don't have that system, I listen to my music like that too. But I try and switch ears occasionally. Hey, you know, actually, this is, here's a practical one. When, when you're bouncing mixes, maybe for even your YouTube stuff, um, do you guys reference your mix on your phone and all that? Well, I, of course. I reference YouTube videos on my phone. <clears throat> I reference YouTube videos on my phone all the time. Yeah. yeah yes, I do. Okay, a couple more questions here. Any, any other questions from the audience? Thanks. So what would interest me is, um, you talked about the fear of some singer that came into your studio, like um, that she wouldn't accept any imperfections because she thought like people would find it weird. And, she, she, and I think she has a point because people are used now to music for a few decades that it's really per perfected like, uh, Everything's on grid and the audit, you think. So do you actually think that new pop music ca ca coming out having these imperfections that people would actually find it weird or it would not be as successful as perfected music? So do you think that people are so used to it now that you have to make it perfect? I mean, yeah. I, I, th that. I think so. I think that uh, uh, it, if you kind of have to cleanse your palate and listen to some unfixed music. When, I, when I'm at the Falcons football game, that's, I'm talking football. Gridiron. Gridiron. And I hear Back in Black being played over the, th over the stadium speakers. Everyone is moving. And because, you know, and if you were to put that on a grid and look at it, it's all over the place in a good way. And people move to it. But... If you're listening to the radio and you're listening to, you know, uh, Ariana Grande, and then it went into Back in Black, it would probably sound kind of weird. You're like, whoa, what is this? Not the singing. Brian Johnson's pretty in tune for his, uh, his singing. But, uh, but the beat, when you hear stuff that's unquantized, I think it sounds weird to people nowadays. It doesn't sound weird to me, but I think it sounds weird to most people. I think that once we get used to a certain uh, sound, like comp just the idea of compression, compressed vocals, or like just over, like, you know, like the first time that a, an electric guitar was overdriven and recorded, that probably sounded pretty weird to somebody like Freddie Green. But then people got used to it, and then now to hear Freddie Green style chunk chunk on the electric guitar, that would sound very strange. Uh, I think that's just the progress of music. And it's not even progress, it's just the forward momentum of music and time. So yes, tuning vocals is now very much the standard, and to go back to another way would just be, a, it would just be dating the music. It's not wrong, right or wrong, it's just dating the music to another era where tuning vocals wasn't standard. Like, e even if the vocals are dead on, there's something about a tuned vocal which just sounds more modern to most people, and it's, you know, not bad or not good, it's just what it is. I think that's usually how I think about things. Things are not bad or good, you have to accept what it is and then make your decisions after that. I will yeah. say this, that being older than most of the people in here, <laughs> when I listen to drums from the 70s that are all dead, in the 80s we thought, oh man, this sounds so dated. But then by the 90s, we were like, that's nah, not so bad. Then by the 2000s, we were like, oh, that's cool. That sounds retro. Then people once again tried to get their drums to sound like that. But the things that always sounded good were the natural sounds. That's why John Bonham, that's why people like Led Zeppelin. Natural drum sounds never go out of style. I think a natural vocal take would really always withstand the test of time, kind of like wearing a black T-shirt. No, you know, People could look at my videos in 30 years and say, He's wearing a black T-shirt. Okay, that's cool. They might say my hair looks weird, but uh, you know, like you, I was around in the '70s and I had weird hair like everyone else, and the '80s. But you know, <laughs> it's it's uh, 
you never know what, what things are going to sound like to people 20 years from now. So maybe all these tuned vocals are going to sound bizarre. Oh my God, that's so dated. That's so 2015 or whatever. That's, it's definitely going to be the case that way. Yeah. <laughs> the 808, as awesome as an 808 sounds, is going to sound so dated in 10 years. But, the, bl but the black t-shirt, by the way, Adam's Lick t-shirt is a awesome t-shirt oh yeah that will never go out definitely, of style. yeah definitely per purchase some of those i just have to <laughs> have to put a little plug out there i saw Thanks, it it's some, it's some seriously nice material <laughs> and uh so i think that that uh, is if there's any, not any more questions i think we're going to conclude this this has been a fantastic yeah, yeah. a fantastic uh gitcon 2018 Woo! we're going to have some blues tonight and I'd like to thank Adam for being my co-host here. And Thanks, thank Rick. you all for, uh, for coming here and get that Lick t-shirt. Thanks, Thanks a lot.